Okay, I think we've got nearly everybody, so uh, we'll make a start. Uh, thank you all for joining us today uh, for this webinar on considering nocturnal pollinators, Saim and the All Island Pollinator Plan. Uh, the event will last until around 4.30 and we will be doing Q&A sessions throughout. So please do pop your questions into the Q&A box on your toolbar and we'll look to answer those as and when we can. Uh, that's it for me on the technical side. Uh, just, yeah, please also use the chat to network with other attendees and ask, post any links or ask any further questions. Um, and I'll now hand over to Brian to officially open the session. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, uh, Christy. Thank you very much. And welcome, everybody, to this uh, event, which I, I'm looking really looking forward to. Um, and thank you for the CIEM for my invitation and also to uh, get everybody audience together it's great to have these these meetings uh, it'd be great to have them in face to face but uh, a zoom is is not too bad uh, an alternative so um you've hopefully all had the program so um i will introduce it my, in myself i'll have a few slides uh, i maybe not take the full 25 minutes and then we'll have a talk by richard and then the q, q a session uh, a break and then callum and Andy will then follow up with other talks. So the the I'm going to share my screen now. Hopefully, will uh, any technical hitches? And that one should come up. Is that? Uh, uh, yep, yeah, that's coming up perfect. Coming up perfectly. Okay. So um, yeah, my name is Brian Nelson. I'm the invertebrate ecologist with National Parks and Wildlife Service in the Science and Biodiversity Unit. Um, and I have the remit for all, virtually all invertebrate species in, in Ireland. I'll maybe elaborate a wee bit that in a minute. Uh, so I've been involved with uh, pollinators in various guises um, since about 2006. Um, and then since I joined NPWS in 2010, um, I, I, was, I became uh, on the steering group for the All Island Pollinator Plan, which started about 2015, I've now relinquished that role. Another person in MPWS, Annette, is now taking that over in the second, uh, the second um, iter iteration of it. Uh, but I still, I still have the, the role of uh, invertebrate over research in invertebrates. So I'm just going to give you a wee bit of uh, background on the developments in Ireland. Um, and it all started in in 2006, to say, uh, whenever there was a research project uh, jointly between Queens and Belfast and Trinity in Dublin, and they produced this regional red list of Irish bees. And this was the first uh, red list produced in any group of Irish insects following the IUCN guidelines. There had been previous red lists, but the the new IUCN guidelines were used in this and. This is where the figure that is often quoted that of 100 species of our wild Irish bees, a third or threatened in some way. And that comes from this red list. Uh, the authors of the red list, then the, there was a bit of a lull in that. But uh, Una particularly was joined the, uh, when she joined the National Biodiversity Data Centre, uh, which was set up in the 20s, 2010s, about, 20, about 2010. Uh, she started to work on the All Island Pollinator Plan. It's obviously an idea she'd had for some time. And in 2015, that was launched. Now, that was uh, yeah, a unique event in, in, in Irish um, natural history. Doing anything like that that ever happened before. And the, the plan has proved to be extremely successful. Um, it's been adopted by lots and lots of organisations. The, the emphasis of the plan is on actions voluntary actions by participants so it's not a top-down government-led initiative it's a it's very much a bottom-up so people do what they they can and they cooperatively signal that to to, to other members there are there are actions and, and things with it and they sign up to those actions and they do them so, so it covers all sectors of our society and um, from farmers to conservationists to church groups to sports groups 
anybody who manages a bit of land or feels they can influence the management of the land to promote pollinators can take part in the thing and that 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 is how the the scheme has developed and it has not had any it has it has had funding from government but it was set up without without that uh, in this governments have uh, it's not a government led and it's not a government owned um initiative which i think is part of its strength and the the, the first plan ran from 2015 to 2020 and the second plan which is now in operation started in 2021 slight change in emphasis on on the uh, in the second one the the first one very much did focus on bees and, and the focus is still on 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 wild bees um but the honeybee has come as there's a section on honeybee in the second one that sort of sits outside it but within the plan um, and there's a bit more emphasis on other pollinators but essentially it is still largely bees uh, and they've done lots and lots of leaflets um, and there's one that I just show there which is management for the the rarest Irish bumblebee which is the great yellow bumblebee which is confined to basically one locality in the west coast of Ireland and hopefully that will beget uh, management for that species and at least conserve the populations hopefully with other initiatives increase it. Um, uh, so, sorry, so, Brian. Sorry, just to, not to interrupt you there, but just I think we're still on your first slide. I'm not sure. If oh, oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, uh, I think I'm. There might be a little arrow at the bottom. Is there? Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, we've missed these now. <laughs> but, right. Okay. Sorry. Well. No. Perfect. The, the, yeah. Okay, sorry. I, I, yeah, I'm looking at one screen, and and it should be the second screen. I was actually changing. Yeah. Okay. So there, there's the pollinator plan. So you're all seeing that, and then hopefully, if we yeah. go down to the next one, yeah. Uh, I'll skip a slide now. Right. So the uh, an another initiative, which uh, this, we're not going global. Um. So one of the um things that happened dur during my tenure in, in PWS is the setting up of this organization called the Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, which is it's probably simplest to, to describe it as it's a, as a biodiversity equivalent of the um, climate change uh, panel, though it's not a legal convention in any way. So it's a group of like-minded countries, government representatives, uh, scientists, and other community groups, and other, other uh, interested groups, uh, producing the scientifically robust plan, uh, reports on the status of pollinators and pollination. It, it, it is important to notice it's not just on pollinators, it is on pollination and food production. And this was the very first um, IPBES uh, assessment that was done. And that has really helped kickstart a lot of developments uh, on the European scale, and in other parts of the world. And uh, Ca Callum, Callum McGregor, who we'll hear on his, his um, scientific report is actually features quite heavily in the IPBES, in the IPBES assessment. It's one of the few studies on nocturnal pollinators uh, that they're able to draw on in, the, in that report. So again, this report is largely on, on bees and the, in, the uh, economic and social benefits that we get from pollination, which again is, is largely bee Focus, but it does recognise uh, pollination by lots of other groups, and as is global, of course, that that includes things like hummingbirds, bats, uh, moths, uh, midges that pollinate cocoa plants, uh, as well as as well as the bee. Uh, and that, that report is well worth well worth having a look at. Uh, it is it is an excellent summary of the situation. And within the EU, then the IPBES report was a was a a major driver in what the EU are doing. So at the EU level, we now come to uh, uh, the European initiative, and and within the EU currently there are quite a few initiatives. The European uh, the EU um, promoted the European Red List of Bees that was produced in twenty sixteen, and again that that is bringing to focus the the decline in wild bees. And based on that uh, and the IPBES report, the EU have set up this pollinator initiative. And they're also then promoting national pollinator monitoring scheme. And hopefully that policy 
area will lead into improvements in the common agriculture policy. Uh, pollinators becoming much more focused in, in that scheme and the declines in pollinators prevent um, reversed. That's still up in the air. I'm not quite sure how, how that is, uh, is going yet. But uh, it, in Ireland, we are now starting in 2022, we're starting now a pilot for the EU pollinator monitoring scheme. Again, if you go online, you, you will find a very large document which recommends a monitoring scheme for pollinators on the EU level. It does not focus on moths. Moths are not a, a core part of that um, scheme, but it will be focusing on bees and hoverflies. But uh, within Ireland, we, we are actually going to start that next year and funding has been given to, to do that. So that will be something that will come on, on board in the future. Um, if we then switch to, again, Ireland, uh, a red list again. I just want to highlight that uh, we have got a moth red list and Andy may refer that to this in his talk, but I'll just give this one slide, which just shows that there is, there is an, an all Ireland red list for moths. And uh, we don't have a very high level of threat. Um, it's about just under 10% just under of our moths are threatened. Uh, sorry, no, just over ten percent. Um, but it does, it does reflect, it does reflect the great deal of recording of moths and the importance of moths, not just for pollination, as we hear about, but also uh, for food for bats. We don't have many in insectivorous nocturnal birds, um, but certainly bats would be the, be a, a, a very important thing. And then the the ecosystem services that moths provide uh, in terms of seed production of wild plants and then food for birds is, is obviously very, very important. So that's just to give you a flavor of what's happening in Ireland, um, where all these things lead to in the end, we, we, we will, time will tell, but uh, there are a lot of things going on in the background, not just, uh, not just the obvious things. So hopefully that will lead to general better policies in uh, informed people um, for better policies to try and promote these. So I'm going to stop uh, talking and we're going to uh, hear from Richard. So I'll stop sharing my screen. If I can find my biography. So Richard, so uh, Richard is going to be our first uh, speaker. And uh, Richard is, uh, has looked at the interaction between plant and pollinators, especially at the aquatic terrestrial interface. I'm not quite sure what that means. And I'm looking forward to hearing that. Um, he is uh, he's currently looking at flooding in freshwater systems. So maybe he's not working directly on nocturnal pollinators, but uh, without any further ado, Richard, we'd like to hear your talk, please. Yep. Thank you, Brian. Uh, let's see here. Let me share my screen. Right. Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, great. So uh, thank you, Brian, and thank you to, to Liz and all the uh, CIEEM uh, organizers of this event uh, for inviting me along. So uh, to, to Brian's uh, question, this work was actually done uh, as part of my PhD a few years ago. Uh, some of it's been published uh, that, that I'll talk about today. Some of it has was published early last year, and then some of it hasn't been published. I'm still working on getting it to into publication ready uh, format. Um, but so, so so my work does look at uh, moths as pollinators or as as uh, contributors to to uh, pollen pollination services. So let's see here. Oh, great, that should move. So just a bit of background uh, that I can provide for those who might be unfamiliar. We know that moths are found in uh, all types of habitats in the British Isles, cer certainly within most of the world, you can find moth species. Uh, They're actually one of the more diverse group of animals within the world. Uh, globally, moths uh, are about 160,000 species. Uh, of those, Ireland has about thir just over 1,300 moth species. 
Uh, so that's a lot of species. And in fact, when you compare it to the more well-known butterfly species, butterflies are only 37 species. So uh, there are a lot more moths out there that, and, and they actually form an important leak in the food chain. So they can be uh, food for birds, uh, for dragonflies and other predatory insects. Um, they feed on plants. The larvae we know can actually be quite destructive to crops and your, the plants in your garden, but the adults can also be uh, feeding on the flowers and that might help with pollination, which I'll talk about in a moment. Moss, however, are uh, facing a lot of impacts to their population numbers. Like uh, many other of other pollinating insect groups, uh, they're so face, facing some, some drastic declines. This uh, report from uh, the Department for Environment and Food and Rural Affairs in the UK that was released in 2015 showed uh, quite a precipitous decline in uh, moth population numbers. Uh, and the work by uh, Conrad et al certainly showed that about uh, two thirds of about 300 species over a 35 year period declined. That said, there's a bit of nuance there. Uh, work that, that uh, Callum, who will speak a little bit later, did, uh, he uh, published this a, a, a little while ago, showed that there's some nuance to that. Um, certainly there have been declines, but maybe not as precipitous as we've seen. Certainly the biomass isn't of moths isn't actually decreasing at, at such an alarming rate. And in some cases it's quite stable, but there are some declines and uh, there are a lot of different drivers of these declines. So moths are facing uh, a lot of impacts from human activity, anthropogenic impacts as we call them. Uh, the two main drivers that are, that are leading to population declines in moth for moth populations are habitat loss and climate change. And within uh, habitat loss, the two drivers of habitat loss are agricultural intensification and changes to woodland management. Uh, Callum, who again will be speaking a little later, he uh, actually has shown that light pollution causes feeding distraction, which can interrupt those uh, pollen transport uh, networks. Uh, and then the late Douglas Boys uh, released a paper that showed that, that they also uh, distract from m mating. Uh, so that could lead to another population decline if they can't recruit the next generation. In terms of moth research, uh, the ecological importance of moths have not been uh, well researched in the past. And there's a few reasons for that. Either they've been considered a pest, uh, su such as their larvae, as I've mentioned. Um, and so all of the research goes into how to prevent larvae from eating crops. Or uh, a lot of people, you ask them what they think about moss and they hate them because they eat their clothes. And that actually only turns out to be a few, a very few species, uh, just a dozen or so around the globe actually eat clothes. They might also be considered not charismatic enough to deserve our attention. They might be considered drab. Uh, certainly the most common description of by an average person might be that uh, moth is just quite brown or gray and quite, quite ugly. But hopefully through the pictures that you see uh, in today's uh, pre different presentations, we'll show you that moths are indeed quite beautiful. Uh, fortunately, the knowledge gap in terms of what moths are contributing to e ecosystem functioning is narrowing and we're, we're learning quite a lot. In terms of pollination, uh, it's been known for a while that some of the larger uh, moth species, most notably the hawk moths, uh, do contribute to pollination. In fact, they have their own um, uh, pollination syndrome named after them. It's called sphingophily. And this is where, uh, a, so a hawk moth hovers in front of the flower um, like a hummingbird, and then it sends out its tongue into, usually they're quite tubular flowers, so they need really long tongues to reach into the nectar, and that, and then uh, the pollen will be deposited on that tongue-like structure and rolled back in, and the next time they visit a flower, 
uh, hopefully pollination occurs. There's also some micro moth species uh, that are known to pollinate plants specifically to help their larvae in the next generation survive. So, so there's a bit of pollination that's known. Uh, and we know that they feed on both pollen and nectar and the potential is there for them to pollinate plants as they feed at new flowers. We also know that there are some moth plant mutualisms in the world. So the, a mutualism is where the moth depends on the plant for food and the plant depends on the moth for uh, pollination. However, a lot of these are not quite strict, so it's not the end of the world if the moth doesn't find the, the plant or vice versa. Uh, here in the British Isles, there are some mutualism with, uh, with moths with the Silene flowers, uh, genus of flowers, and the, the Caryophyllaceae family. Interestingly, uh, in, the, in the British Isles, yucca plants uh, don't actually originate here. They're from the Americas and they do not set seed because yucca moths are not found here. They're still uh, in the Americas. So that's some interesting facts there. In terms of pollen transport, so it, it's been a bit hard as uh, up to recently to kind of understand moth contributions to pollination directly. Uh, so we used pollen transport as, as kind of a proxy to understand uh, how they might be moving pollen through the landscape and to understand what they're feeding on. Um, as I've mentioned, a lot of that has focused on the hawk moss. Uh, settling moss, which we're talking about a lot today, they've received less attention. You know, settling moss are, are moss species that they will uh, when they feed on a flower, they sit quite close to the flower. So their body sits right up close to the flower. Uh, there's been some important initial work earlier in the 2010s uh, by Banza et al. and Devoto et al. Uh, kind of in, in a boreal, managed boreal landscape and as well as a agricultural, um, a Mediterranean uh, landscape. And it, it showed some of the species that uh, the flower species here, such as heather and ragwort uh, that the uh, moths were feeding on. Uh, Callum will speak, be speaking a little bit later about the work that he's done with the effects of light pollution on pollen transport. And he's also written about some new methods for identifying pollen on moths, which is, will be quite helpful as we continue to move forward uh, with understanding moth pollination. So there's some questions that remained that were around as I, I started my PhD. Um, first of all, what do pollen transport networks look like in an agriculturally intensive landscape? A lot of uh, the work that was done was not quite in an agricultural intensive lowland landscape. Um, I wanted to understand if there were any mechanisms of pollen transport by settling moths that might have been overlooked. As I mentioned, they sit quite close to the flower. Uh, pollen swabbing tends to happen just on the proboscis, the tongue, and maybe some of the mouth parts. Um, and I was just wondering if perhaps they're carrying anything on their thorax. Uh, what, what do the pollen transport networks indicate about pollination service by moths? So if we look at some of the plant species that they're visiting on a regular basis, can we perhaps un, uh, focus our efforts to see what sort, what sort of plants are they feeding on that we can protect in the wider landscape, but also can we then focus to see if they might be um, pollinating crops that belong to these same plant families. And finally, uh, you know, a lot it, within agricultural landscapes, the remaining semi-natural habitats that are there um, they are often managed in order to keep them in good shape. And they've, this hasn't been considered in how this might impact um, different uh, species, uh, in this case, the moth, and how that might actually impact pollen transport uh, by the moth. So the two driving questions uh, for, for my PhD research on moths was the structure of, what is the structure of settling moth pollen transport networks? Uh, using uh, farmland ponds as a semi-natural habitat, which are which border arable fields, uh, 
and then compare those networks to those of diurnal or daytime flying pollinators, the bees, hoverflies, and butterflies. And then I also wanted to investigate how settling moth pollen transport networks responded to uh, habitat management. Uh, so does managing the pond habitat improve populations and does that lead to more interactions? Well, that was the two driving questions for my research. So I <clears throat> had nine ponds that I studied and I captured over two years, I captured uh, moths during the growing season and I swabbed many, many, many moth species uh, for, um, for pollen. And what I found is 103 different species were carrying 47 different plant species. So up here in each network, we see plants and down below is the, poll the, the pollinating insects. So here it's moths. And we see quite a high number of connections between the moths feeding on um, the plants. Down below, we see uh, two diurnal networks. I separated out the bee networks because social bees tend to uh, be quite targeted. They tell each other where to find plants. So I wanted to separate that out a bit to understand some of the solitary bee, hoverfly, and um, butterfly networks. And what we see is there's set kind of the same number of plant species visited, but quite a lot more moths are involved and a lot greater connection. Uh, and in this, we see this graph, what we see is that uh, for, let's focus on these three families, the Arabids, the Geometrids, and the Noctuids. Noctuids contributed the most to carrying pollen um, and, and uh, about, and then followed by Geometrid and Arabid type moths. And uh, about 45% uh, of moths that I swabbed were carrying pollen, so roughly half. And the, the major uh, food plants that they were visiting, the pollen that we were finding was, uh, bramble was one of the key ones. Also uh, white clover, which is in the legume family. So this is in the rose family. This is the legume family. Uh, water mint, uh, which grows around some of the ponds. That was where that was present. That was found in, in a bit of abundance. Pardon me on moss. That's in the mint family. And then quite a bit uh, for the early flying moth species, gray willow, which is always uh, a common plant to find around a farmland pond. Uh, gray willow was really the go-to food source for uh, early flying moths. In terms of the uh, major uh, moth pollen transporters uh, at, mo at ponds, uh, I should mention that these ponds were in Norfolk uh, in the UK. Uh, most of them are, as I said, are in the Noctuid family. Uh, so of the, the larger uh, settling moth species, these, this is like a large yellow underwing. Um, and uh, we've got a Hebrew character here with lot, lots of different types, uh, a silver Y. We have lots of different types of noctuid species here, and then a, a common footman moth here, which is in the Arabid family. So the noctuids seem to be contributing the most to pollen transport in agricultural landscapes. So uh, I looked at, uh, I swabbed both the uh, underbody of the moth and the, as well as the, the proboscis, the tongue. And what I found was that 57% of the pollen I detected came from the underbody. And in fact, research uh, done uh, that had been published just before I published this work had found that uh, there are some plants that depend on a particular type of moth pollinating them based on the pollen that they carry on their underbody. I also found that pollen from seven plant species, pollen uh, from seven plant species were found on moths and had no observed visits by diurnal pollinators. So there's potentially some unique plant uh, nocturnal pollinator interactions going on there. So I brought in management, as I uh, mentioned before. So uh, ponds, a lot of farmland ponds in the UK are overgrown uh, and management and, uh, has been introduced as perhaps a way to restore them to a better state of biodiversity and uh, leaving them in a state of, of no management uh, 
was actually seemed to be best in terms of the number of moss species involved and uh, the general complexity. Uh, restoring a pond by uh, cutting back uh, a lot of the, the overgrowth of the woody vegetation, such as the willow, uh, that resulted in a fairly similar uh, interaction. But then there's this thing, uh, there's this type of management that we re that I referred to as long-term management. This is these are ponds that have for the last several decades been managed about every five to ten years to keep them open. So they do uh, the farmer, the land manager comes in here and um, cuts down some of the uh, the woody growth around here, and that actually resulted in fewer moth species, but they were visiting more plant species. So there's an, so, some interesting trends going on here that need perhaps a bit more exploration. Uh, not quite able to say what's going on, but it does appear that uh, no management or restoration is probably the best thing for these networks. So just a quick part one of my conclusion. Uh, so the work that I did showed that moth networks were richer at the pollinator level uh, when compared to uh, daytime po pollinator networks. Um, most, both in terms of the moths as well as the daytime species, uh, most of these observations were of generalist species, and that's because there's already less specialization in agricultural landscapes because of the intensification that's already happened. There does seem to be some, uh, what I term resilience between the, the diurnal and the nocturnal networks. Uh, so, so a lot of, they're visiting a lot of the same plants. And so if perhaps if we lose some uh, day flying uh, pollinators or some night flying pollinators, if they're visiting the same plants, perhaps those plants are still getting pollinated. But there was also some unique interactions so, so there's a lot of re, uh, resilience, but there's also uniqueness there. Uh, as I mentioned, management of semi-natural habitats, particularly ponds, may lead to uh, changes in complexity, but that seems quite nuanced a, a, as of yet, and we need to explore that further. But the work that I did on the, the when I looked at all nine ponds as one, it really showed that the that perhaps all these different ponds at di different types of management schemes uh, created a, a, a mosaic, a very heterogeneous mosaic of different habitat types at the landscape scale. And uh, research has shown that that is what moths prefer. And so if we investigate this a bit further, perhaps we will see that a mosaic of ponds uh, around throughout the landscape is actually best for moths. So I just want to briefly mention some wider work that's been emerging in the earlier this year, two papers came out that showed crop, uh, one showed crop pollination and one sh intended, showed intended crop pollination. So this paper by Buxton et al. Uh, showed, uh, this was in New Zealand and it involved moths carrying avocado pollen. Uh, and the authors here showed that moths were carrying enough pollen that potential pollination could occur. They did not measure it directly, but they did show that that moths were indeed visiting avocado groves and they were and they were carrying their pollen. Now, work done by Robertson et al. Uh, in the United States uh, over 2017 and 2018, they did this in apple orchards, and what they found was that moths were indeed, oops, they were indeed uh, contributing to actual pollination. So they were measuring seed set, the actual act of pollination that leads to seed set and fruit, fruit formation. Uh, and what, what's interesting here is, I'll point this out, this is over 2017 and 2018, is, is uh, th there's a lot of similarity in the numbers here. Uh, maybe bees and butterflies are a little bit better, but but there are no significant differences. Again, that highlights some resilience between nocturnal uh, pollinators and di diurnal pollinators that they're sharing duties that uh, that we really haven't understood previously. So that's some of the wider work that's come out just within this year. 
So the take home message that I would uh, like to impart to you is first that moths are transporting pollen from many different plant families, and this includes major crops. And that, so this is, they can play an important role for not only the natural functioning of ecosystems, but ecosystem services that we as humans rely on, such as crop pollination. We need to include moths more in, in more research that, is that focuses on pollination and pollen transport networks, uh, because we're only just beginning to understand them and we're beginning to realize it's much, uh, they're, they're playing a much greater role than we previously even considered. And so because of that, role, we, we really need to remember their value and consider their value, uh, not only in terms of research, but as uh, but for resource management, that, that we can't just think of uh, the, the, the animals that we see, the insects that we see pollinating during the day, the bees and the butterflies and the hoverflies. We also need to think of those that are visiting uh, plants after we've gone in for the day. And, and that they are contributing quite a bit. And, and we just need to focus on them a bit more as well. Uh, so that, that's uh, my presentation. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. That's a fascinating talk and uh, came across very well. Thank you very much. Um, so if anybody's got any questions, don't see any questions yet, please put them into the chat and uh, one of us will uh, direct them to Richard, but maybe I can start off with Richard by asking a question is, do we know um, when moth, moths are visiting flowers, are, are they, do they, do the females, for example, have to visit flowers to get their egg, eggs developed, or is there any research that, know, uh, that is it knows whether, you know, why, why they, whether they have to visit flowers and, and how many species have to do that? Yeah, I, I don't, I'm not aware of studies that focus on specific numbers of species and what species, but I know that there's, I mentioned earlier that we know that there are micromoth species that uh, go to visit flowers, they pick up pollen, they immediately pollinate the, another flower from a different plant, but the same, the same type of plant, and then they lay their eggs. And what they do that for is so that their larvae, when the larvae develop at the, at the same time that the fruit is developing, they have something to eat. And it's become an evolutionary strategy, which is quite fascinating that they've done. That, that is in tropical species. So I'm not sure if there's anything like that here in more kind of temperate climates, but certainly that we know of some moss species doing that, but um, there, it's kind of a very niche area that people are studying. We've got a question here in from Sophie, which were the seven plant species that moths were pollinating and the diurnal pollinators weren't visiting? Uh, that's a good, good question, which I don't, of course, have that answer off the top of my head. Um, I will uh, find, hunt that and find that and respond to that question in kind. Uh, you can also find it in, in the paper in biology letters uh, from last year. Yeah, maybe you could uh, put the. Uh, have you got? Have we got the title of your paper? Maybe we could get put that uh, into the no, chat. No, I can. Well, I can so. put that in in, yeah. in the chat as well. Yeah, yeah that would be useful. Um. So yeah, just 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 following up that that point about mic micromoths, yeah, pollinating obviously to get the seed. Then you, you can imagine that plants don't want that to happen in a way. Yep. Um. You know, they they're quite happy to have the. The pollination, but they don't want then the moths to eat eat yep. the plant. So uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah, it's, it's one of those evolutionary things you think about and things. Yeah, what what is the advantage to that? But um, it clear, clearly, yeah, the pollination is what they they don't want to be eaten then by the moths themselves. Yeah, yeah. It's, it is a bit of a trade off, and that plant in particular. Uh, again, it's a tropical plant. I can't quite remember the name of, uh, but it does has evolved a way that it. it figures out that some of its um, uh, some of its seeds are being co-opted by the larvae of the moth and so they they abort the fruit so it drops the fruit so it can't develop any further and then the moths die uh, the moth larvae die but it's a trade-off at what point do they do it so it still happens 
uh, the, the fruit, the plant knows how to ab abort the fruit, but th it doesn't do enough that it damages the moth or itself. So that's an interesting evolutionary uh, junction there. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's fascinating whenever you, you look at those things. All right, so another question. If I, may, if I may, Brian, just add something to that. Um, there's yeah. been some really interesting work in a, in a plant called White Campion, which we obviously have uh, here in Britain and Ireland, um, which has a similar relationship with a, with a noctuid moth. Um, uh, and, and some work done in, I think, in Switzerland on this species has shown really nicely that um, that both male and female moths visit the flowers, both male and female moths pollinate the flowers. Obviously, it's only the females that lay the eggs. So there's some advantage to the plant in having a really enthusiastic, dedicated pollinator. Um, and if the flower is lucky and only gets visited by males, then it's going to get really nice seed set. If it's unlucky and gets female, then it's probably going to get no seed set. But actually, it's a net benefit to the plant as yeah. well um, from, from having this, this really yeah, dedicated species of pollinator in that particular um, system. Yeah, yeah. I mean, again, again, the plant, the plant wants wants to serve wants that service to get mm. its seed. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, it doesn't then want to be eaten to to pieces. But and and the, and the moth the moth then needs, of course, the seeds to set to get the new plants uh, for its young and future generations. You know, there's no point eating it all the plants. Uh, right. We've got another question on the chat here from David. So David asked that you mentioned a number of the important plant species for moths. Have you identified a hierarchy of plant species within the UK and Ireland that may be most important and therefore have potential use in future management planning? Great talk as well. Uh, so, well, thank you to, to David for, for that and for that question. Uh, so uh, I haven't identified a hierarchy of plants. I think uh, work is still kind of ongoing on that. We know that some plant species tend to be quite important, certainly, the, the work that I did around ponds in agricultural landscapes showed that uh, bramble was quite important. Uh, things like white clover and other arable uh, flowers were quite important, but it might be different in a, in a, a uh, certainly the work that uh, Devoto et al showed that things like heather and um, uh, what was the other, uh, uh, ragwort, that, that was quite important to kind of boreal species of moth. So I think it depends on what type of landscape you're in. So I think we're still gathering, uh, scientists are still gathering data to understand what plants are most likely to be visited. And hopefully we can within a few years uh, have developed kind of a hierarchy that, that uh, shows us what plants we really need to protect. I would also add to that though, it's not, just one or two type of plants we need to protect, they really need a quite a diverse range of plants to choose from. And it's not just plants for the adults, it's plants for the larvae. And oftentimes the larvae will eat different plants than the adults feed on. So it's really important to note that while there are some plants that might be really worth protecting and conserving for them, they really need a diverse range of plants to choose from. So it might not actually be quite helpful to have this hierarchy as, as a hard and fast tool. Okay, thanks, uh, Richard, for that. Um, don't see any other questions. So I, I, I've got, the, do, do we know the main mechanism by which moths um, find plants? I mean, are, are they finding plants visually or are they finding plants well, by scent? At, at, yeah, at night, it's really hard to see. They do tend to visit uh, and, they, and moths do have uh, we, we assume they have fairly poor eyesight, although they can really see our artificial lights, which Callum will talk about. Um, they tend to go for pale colored flowers, uh, but there's also the, really it's the, the, uh, the nasal, uh, if to, to use that, the nasal senses that they have. So the, the, they, so smell, so. they smell the flowers. Uh, a lot of times uh, flowers uh, that flower at night will emit a, an odor. You might notice that in your garden often, like if you have jasmine or if you have, perhaps if you have Nicotiana in your garden during the summer, you will smell a beautiful, quite a beautiful scent at, at around dusk. And that's because the plants specifically want to be pollinated by moths. And so they send out olfactory signals uh, and that, uh, that kind of attracts moths. 
we don't know i don't think there's a lot of work that looks at the behavior of why they choose certain plants over others but i think they're just looking for certain cues and they're looking for for a food source when they're yeah that's, that's, that's one of the mysteries uh, yeah that, that's probably a slightly unfair question for you maybe it should have been better directed at Callum. but uh, mm. uh yeah i mean that's when the mystery made people trap moths but I, I I keep wondering, you know, what 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 are the moths doing if they, if they weren't in the trap? You know, mm. and how does that relate to uh, to what they actually do? So we, we we've got one. I think we just have next next question here from Marianne, and then we we'll, we'll have we'll have a break. Okay. Um, so uh, Marianne says, in comparing wetland manage, management regimes for agriculture areas, were there any interventions such as deliberate planting, or were there just or were these just what occurred without intervention? So okay. yeah, was it yeah. So so in terms of uh, it, the the work that I did uh, it, uh, with the group that I, uh, the lab group I was with at, at UCL, uh, we when we went in and we managed ponds or we restored a pond, we just cut back the woody vegetation and we dredged uh, out the pond sediment to to expose the seed bank. But we didn't actually plant any plants. We just let come up what was there. So what was in the seed bank is what was there. And, and we feel that that was, is probably, it might not be the best uh, solution in e every case, but it was certainly the solution within the Norfolk area. And it, it means it's less money to spend uh, in, in terms of your uh, management plan. You, if you don't have to pay for plants to plant, plus the man hours that it takes to plant, um, that is actually quite beneficial to 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 management plants on a cost benefit uh, basis. But a lot of these plants came back naturally and they prefer disturbance. So they actually want that sort of disturbance to come in. And, and that that's what was interesting. And the management is what improved uh, the floral resources around the pond. Uh, and in, uh, seeing her, her uh, Marianne's comment about invasive species, we haven't ever seen any invasive species. We've certainly been on the lookout for them. Uh, Crashula is one of the big things that we're worried about in, invading ponds, and we never had had a problem with it. But it could be just the fact that they were in intensive kind of farmland, so you're not seeing a lot of cross contamination between ponds. Okay, thank, thanks very much, Richard, for that uh, answer. Um, so I think um, at this stage we will um, have a break, uh, take 10 minutes, 10 minutes scheduled break. So if we come back, that'll be neatly come back at three o'clock then uh, to hear Callum's talk. If, if there are any other questions that people want to direct to Richard, um, we can always deal with them at the Q&A at the end, end of the session if Richard's uh, still available to uh, um, to answer those questions. So, uh, yeah, we'll see you back at three o'clock. Thanks, everyone.
So, uh, I'm not sure, uh, can everybody hear me then? Um, yeah, you're back. Yeah, yeah, we're back. We're back. We're back in. I'm not, not sure whether we were we were muted for ten minutes. So, I uh, hope everybody had a nice little break there. Um, so, yeah, I just want, wanted to first of all say um, that uh, Adam Montel, who was who was um, maybe mentioned in one of the earlier program uh, iterations, uh, unfortunately couldn't make it to the event today. I'm not sure whether he's, he's listening in, but uh, I know Adam was uh, had a very nasty dose of COVID, so we wish him all the well and a uh, speedy recovery. Which I think he's on, on the way to, I think he's, uh, uh, but I know he's, he certainly couldn't have taken part with his uh, out of action, say, with COVID. And uh, just a reminder, yeah, we um, apologies to, to Mary Ann that uh, there was a question in the Q&A that I didn't see. Um, maybe if everybody puts them in the chat, then uh, they won't they won't get missed. But we, we'll come back to that question uh, maybe later on, uh, or if Richard uh, sees it, he might want to answer it on, on the on the system. So um, we're now going to go um, on to Callum McGregor's talk. Callum McGregor works for the BTO in Wales. Um, that's the British Trust for Ornithology, so uh, a bird. Uh, organization uh, BTO do a lot of research on on bird bird populations, and moths obviously are critical to to a lot of uh, birds, um, either for feeding the feeding the, feeding the young or the adults. Um, so Callum Callum is going to talk to us about uh, just to get bit, the dark side of street lighting. Over to you, Callum. Thank you very much, Brian. Um, I will share my slides. Um... That one, I think. Hopefully, you can now see those. Um, yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Uh, thanks very much for the introduction. Um, as Brian said, I currently work for the for the British Trust for Ornithology in our in our Wales office. Um, but my background is not uh, not particularly as an ornithologist, um, and I'm here to speak to you today because I undertook my my PhD on the topic of nocturnal pollination by moths and the impacts of artificial light at night on these um, nighttime interactions between moths and flowers. So that work was carried out um, uh, between Newcastle University and the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology, um, and also the charity Butterfly Conservation who were very heavily involved, including as, as one of the funders of the work. Um, and I am grateful to Richard for already highlighting some of the work I carried out during that PhD on nocturnal pollination it's going to allow me to skip straight ahead to discussing um, the light pollution side of that research today. Um, thank you Richard in, in particular for taking up my suggestion to describe that early work as groundbreaking. Um, I'll make sure your check uh, is in the post. So we've known for centuries since long before the invention of electricity and electric light that moths appear to be attracted to point sources of light at night. And since the invention of electric lights, scenes like these on the right have become really quite familiar uh, with moths and other nocturnal insects um, swarming to, to the bulbs. To preempt a question, why do they fly to lights? Well, the truth is, we honestly still don't know. There are quite a few different theories out there, some of which you've almost certainly heard. Um, but none of which really hold up to investigation. What we do know is that the attraction appears to be strongest at the blue and ultraviolet end of the light spectrum, um, and that will be relevant later in my talk. But other than that, at this stage, I think we simply have to accept that the phenomenon occurs and start to consider its consequences. And once you consider the extent of light pollution globally, it becomes clear that those consequences could be quite severe. The different intensities of colors on this figure and when I zoom into Europe are not terribly important to understand, but in a nutshell, anywhere that isn't depicted in black, that is a place that at the, at the darkest point of the darkest night still experiences more light, more background light than a natural full moonlit night. So, Essentially, we're talking about the complete erosion of natural levels of nighttime darkness. And as you can see within the entirety of Western Europe, that means that essentially the far north of Scotland and bits of Scandinavia are the only places that still have true nighttime. 
Now, a key reason why this might matter is that artificial light at night masks patterns of light and darkness, natural patterns of light and darkness. Astronomers know this very well because artificial light masks their view of the stars. And you can see that on the right hand side of this photo. Uh, this um, source of artificial light here means that all the stars in this part of the sky are, are, are not visible compared to this amazing starry, starry rich sky at the other end of the photo. Astronomers are aware of it, but ecologists should also be aware of it. Virtually all of known life, including humans, uses patterns of light and dark in very fundamental ways to control our daily body, bodily rhythms, and also use seasonal change in the light-dark cycle, going from, uh, well, pretty much this time of year when most of the day is dark to, uh, to the opposite end of the year when most of the day is light, to determine the timing of key life cycle events, events like breeding or hibernation that are really um, critically linked to the season. So there's plenty of reason to suppose that artificial light at night might have an important effect upon moths. Back in 2013, when I started my PhD, the state of play was set out in this report, which showed a long-term decline in moth populations and as you can see from the quotes on the right, it was considered to be unclear whether light pollution was involved in driving those declines, and there had really been no major studies of that. Well, fortunately, that has changed in the intervening uh, eight years or so. Unfortunately, I would say it's now quite clear that light pollution is an important driver of moth declines. And I want to highlight two papers that I think were really critical to nailing this down. Um, this is the first. Uh, it was led by uh, a team of researchers from Wageningen in the Netherlands. Um, and they showed very simply that moths in the Netherlands, moth species in the Netherlands, were much more likely to be declining and doing so more severely if those species were A, nocturnal, and B, strongly attracted to light. And they showed this by comparison to diurnal moths or to those which require other survey methods because they don't appear in moth traps, which, uh, which tend to be baited with light. Interestingly, this team tested a whole range of drivers relating to other things, including climate change and habitat change and pesticide use and so on in this study. And of all of those things, it was light pollution that came out as the single strongest predictor of population trends. The second is this paper, which was mentioned in Richard's talk, um, led by my, my friend and colleague, Doug Boys, who, who very sadly passed away in, in September, um, aged only 25. Um, and this paper was published just a few weeks before he died. Um, Doug surveyed caterpillar abundance in hedgerows and grass road verges, illuminated by streetlights, and compared these to nearby unlit margins. And he found a massive reduction of between a third and a half in the abundance of caterpillars in the presence of street lighting. And that was critical because that was the first paper that, that showed this effect um, in, in an immobile, a, re a relatively immobile life stage, showing these kinds of effects in adult moths, um, which, which several studies, including one that I'm going to present later, have done, um, is interesting, but adult moths are very mobile and will fly to light. Um, caterpillars are not very mobile and don't particularly move to light, and yet there's still a massive effect um, of lighting being present on their abundance. So, moths are declining, check. Artificial light appears to be a cause of it, check. There are a number of mechanisms that may co be contributing to that. Firstly, we know that predators have learned to exploit the attraction of moths and other insects to nighttime light. This includes both um, sit and wait predators like this uh, enterprising and extremely overfed spider, um, and also active predators, uh, particularly a number of species of bats, which, which can be observed hunting around streetlights in a very deliberate way. Moth reproduction is also impacted in multiple ways. And this has been particularly well uh, studied in the winter moth, which is a species with a really unusual life history in that the female shown here is, is completely wingless and flightless. Under usual circumstances, females climb up the trunks of trees, particularly oak trees, um, and start to emit a pheromone which says, come and get me. Um, the males then detect this pheromone and they fly in and, and, and mate with the females. In the presence of a street light, however, we know that this process changes in several ways. Firstly, 
uh, fewer females move up the tree trunk in the first place. Each one that does then emits a lower quantity of that pheromone and probably partly as a consequence of the reduced pheromone emission and partly due to that fundamental attraction to light, fewer males then find their way to a female. So those are some key mechanisms um, involved in the, in the decline of moths, but there, there, there are many others. Um, and Doug Boys wrote a review paper, which, um, which again was published earlier this year, which uh, summarizes them quite well. Now, quite clearly, if moths are pollinators and moths are in decline due to light pollution, that means there's a mechanism by which light pollution can have indirect effects on, on nocturnal pollination, simply because there are fewer moths around to carry out such pollination as a consequence of light pollution. But this graph on screen now is from another study by that same Wageningen group. Um, and here they showed that, that moths in the lab in captivity were much less likely to drink sugar water from artificial flowers when their flight cage was illuminated compared to the, the dark, um, dark controls on, on the right of each plot. That finding is particularly interesting because it raises the possibility of direct effects of light pollution on moth flower interactions. And those direct effects were a key focus of some of my PhD research. The first thing we did was to compare moth activity in field margins that were illuminated by streetlights and matched dark field margins nearby. So we found 20 suitable pairs of sites in Oxfordshire and sampled each pair using three different sampling methods. The first was an adaptation of the standardized transect method that's commonly used to survey for butterflies. Um, and that gave us an idea of what was happening at ground level in the field margins in terms of moth abundance. We also use light traps. These are the standard method for surveying moths, but we placed some fairly heavy ca uh, caveats on what we were willing to interpret from that data set, given that we expected there to be a conflict between the light from the traps and the light from the street lights overhead that wasn't present at the unlit sites. And lastly, we developed a method for surveying overhead flight activity to give us an idea of what was happening higher up at street light level. We found that down at ground level, moth abundance was significantly reduced at lit sites, which are the white bars here, compared to unlit sites, the gray bars. There were fewer moths around at ground level, but several meters up at street light level, the reverse was true and moths were significantly more abundant. Now, we captured all of the moths that we saw at ground level and brought them back into the lab where we swabbed their mouth parts for pollen grains and identified and counted those pollen grains. You can see some examples uh, photographed under the microscope here of, of a pollen grain on the proboscis of a common pug and some on the, uh, on the uh, palps of a, of a burnished brass. Those results were not totally clear cut, but we did find some indications, both that firstly, fewer individual moths were carrying any pollen at all when captured in the vicinity of a street light compared to those captured in the darkness. And secondly, the total cohort of moths captured in the vicinity of street lights were collectively carrying the pollen of fewer plant species than those captured in the darkness. Overall, these results certainly seem to suggest some level of direct disrup disruption of pollen transport by moths and that's apparently being caused by the moths being effectively distracted from going about their usual business and instead, instead spending more time flying laps at street, uh, around a street light at, at, high, uh, at higher altitude rather than, um, rather than visiting flowers in the, uh, at ground level. But there's a key outstanding question because uh, as Richard alluded to, a pollination interaction has two steps, pollen collection and then pollen deposition. But pollen transport that we were measuring in that previous study only requires the first of those steps. So we wanted to investigate whether there was any detectable change in actual pollination rates under streetlights. And we weren't the only people asking this question at that time. So uh, around the same time, Eva Knott and her group in Switzerland published a study where they had measured pollination in uh, the cabbage thistle, Circium oleraceum, at lit and unlit sites. And this flower was. Um, I felt a really interesting choice to study because actually it's typically thought to be pollinated uh, during the daytime by bees. Nevertheless, Eva and colleagues found um, a negative effect of artificial light 
at night upon pollination rates. And that means both that A, nocturnal pollinators had a, a sizable and previously unknown supplementary pollination role in this species, much like what Richard was describing um, in some of the crops uh, in his talk, but also B, that this su supplementary pollination role was being so substantially disrupted by artificial light that it was actually causing a detectable decline in pollination rates in, in the cabbage thistle. So at the same time, we were working on the same question using pretty much the same method, um, but a different plant species, white campion, Silene latifolia, um, which I, I mentioned uh, in the question set, uh, session earlier. Um, and that's a species that's known to be pollinated both diurnally and nocturnally, um, with moths playing the largest role, including that species that, that lays its eggs on the flower, but also uh, the, the, the more general moth community. And in addition to simply looking for an effect like, uh, like Nop and colleagues had done, we also wanted to know whether there was any prospect to mitigate that effect by leveraging either of two ongoing changes in street lighting technology. The first of those changes was the switch from LED technology to the, uh, sorry, the switch to LED technology from the various incumbents. This is an interesting one because there's something of a perception that LEDs could be a solution to light pollution. And although this is now quite an old slide that I made for a talk a few years ago, um, it shows a snippet from an official UK government response to a petition about light pollution, in which uh, the government at the time essentially stated that they were actively encouraging local authorities to switch to LED um, because they felt it was a, a way to combat light pollution. Um, that's, that's debatable in terms of astronomical light pollution, for sure, but it's definitely debatable in terms of ecological light pollution. And at that time, it was very unclear whether LED um, was a good or, or indeed a bad thing in that respect. Um, there was varying evidence to suggest that LEDs might be either more attractive or less attractive to, to insects. So we had no pr prediction about which direction any effect might uh, on pollination might go, but really came into this with an open mind. And, and here are figures from a couple of studies uh, that had been published at that point. On the left, a German study which found that LEDs were the, the least attractive of various light types, including high pressure sodium to insects. But on the right, uh, a study from New Zealand um, that showed completely the opposite, that LEDs were much more attractive than high pressure sodium um, to, to nocturnal insects. The second change in technology was the rollout of part night lighting, where street lights are switched off in the later part of the night principally to save energy and money, but with an added bonus um, demonstrated at that time in bats, that the ecological disruption largely goes away as soon as the light is turned off. Um, so we predicted that under part night lighting, pollination would be perhaps less strongly disrupted than under full night lighting. And so we set up a number of mock street lights that all looked like this um, in field margins on a farm in East Yorkshire. Uh, using both sodium and LED lights. And you'll notice here from the, from the um, spectrographs of the two li lights that we used, um, that there's much more blue light and ultraviolet light emitted by the LED shown in blue than by the sodium lights shown in yellow. Um, bear in mind, of course, what I, what I said earlier in my talk about um, moths being more strongly attracted to blue lights. Um, some of these lights we turned off at midnight, and others we ran all night, and then we had a series of unlit controls as well. And in each of these treatments, we placed a number of white campion plants with unfertilized female flowers and left them out for four days and nights, and then brought them back into the glasshouse and waited to see what developed from the flowers. Rather to our surprise, we found that pollination rates were actually significantly higher under full night lighting than either part night lighting or unlit controls. And there was no difference, no significant difference between part night lighting or unlit controls. That was a bit of a head scratcher. Eventually, we decided that it might be the case that white campion, being a relatively tall flower and uh, quite clearly a white flower, it's in the name, might stand out more and be more visible to moths under lighting. Nonetheless, we are still interpreting this as a disruption to the wider natural system of nocturnal pollination. Moths that are visiting white campion more frequently are likely to be visiting other species in the plant community less frequently. And we are certainly not um, advocating rolling out streetlights as an aid to pollination services anywhere. <laughs>
Comparing um, LEDs to sodium, uh, in this case, we found no difference. They both cause disruption equally under full night regimes, and they both cause less dis disruption under part night regimes, um, the same as each other. So I'm going to wrap up my talk now with a few words on mitigation, which are influenced um, by the work that I've presented today, but are also influenced by a much wider literature than what I've had time to present, um, and including um, studies of, of many more taxa than just moths. Off-the-shelf LED technology um, does not really appear at the moment to be beneficial from the perspective of ecological light pollution. It's at best neutral compared to the incumbent technologies and at, at worst may substantially increase the impacts. It is, however, I would say the clear direction of travel and for a number of good reasons relating to things like energy efficiency. And so we should be thinking very carefully about how we can leverage its great versatility and flexibility to reduce impacts in the future. Um, and for example, there's some really excellent work being done in various parts of the world to investigate whether using LEDs with non-standard color spectra, such as um, those with, with low color temperature, which is what uh, 3000 Kelvin refers to, that's a color temperature, whether those types of lamps can reduce impacts on, on nocturnal eco ecosystems. Part night lighting as a solution has really clear potential to reduce the impact of artificial light at night on ecological systems, much clearer than, than LEDs do. Not only does it remove the direct point source of light for some of the night, but it also allows a period of natural darkness to occur, which could allow some of those processes driven by natural light dark rhythms to continue. The problem, of course, is that part night lighting is terribly, terribly unpopular with people often because of very valid concerns about nighttime safety. And so if it is to be implemented, it really must be done so sensitively. And the last thing we want is to, is to um, have people thinking that we are prioritizing the safety of moths above the safety of humans. And that's something I have been accused of whilst doing press around some of this research. There are other options under development and indeed already in use in some places. And these include things like part night dimming of lights in locations where they can't safely be turned off completely and use of motion sensitive lights to ensure that the lights are only on when they're required to be on. And these methods too hold great potential to reduce the impacts of, of light pollution on, uh, on nocturnal ecosystems, but they're, they're really a long way from being widely adopted, I would say. And of course, the question that we should all be asking ourselves whenever an external light is put in anywhere is, is it actually necessary at all? An awful lot of our human use of artificial light at night is decorative rather than functional. And we're especially keen on doing things like illuminating structures such as churches and bridges, uh, particularly in tourist hotspots. Um, if we were to get rid of that, uh, that particular uh, fad, that particular trend, that would be a, a tremendously easy win from the point of view of reducing light pollution. And with that closing thought, I, um, I thank you very much for your attention and um, hopefully I can answer some questions at the, at the uh, relevant moment. Thanks very much, Callum. That was uh, an excellent talk, uh, a subject that I yeah, know about, but. Uh, I've never heard heard in that detail before. So thanks very much. So um we we will um leave questions if that's okay till we heard after Andy. So um that's that's great. So uh our next talk uh is from Andy Crory. I know Andy very well, uh, and I've heard Andy give talks um many, many times, and I never tire of hearing Andy talk. Uh, he's, he's a great speaker, and uh, we've had two great speakers. But you know, this, uh, Andy will will um, end end this session very well. And Andy works for the Ulster Wildlife Trust. Uh, he's the reserve manager, but he traps a lot of the single site near his home in Newcastle, uh, the wonderful Murloc National Nature Reserve on the County Down coast of Dundrum, where I, I used to I used to work there many many years ago. And it's a it's a wonderful place, and I'm sure a lot of people know it. So, Andy, over to you. Okay, thanks, Brian. Uh, put me under a bit of pressure there, like because <laughs> this could very well end up being a damp squib. Uh, but anyway, yeah. Um, let me see if I can get this working. Mm -mm -mm. The vagaries of 
Zoom meetings. Let's see. Okay. Can everybody see that? Yep. Yeah. Well, there we go. So, yeah, I had to come up with a title and I didn't want to go too much into my obsession with moths because, you know, as you can see, this is an Ulster wildlife slide. So I've very cheekily managed to do this as a hybrid Northern Ireland moth recorder, nature reserves manager uh, talk, which uh, means I could have done some bit more time. Oh dear, let the cat out of the bag there. But um, yeah, I am a Northern Ireland moth trapper. The picture there is anybody who's done moth trap and knows is a, a Robinson trap or a 125 watt MV. Uh, which is actually my nemesis because I spend, uh, in reflection, I've spent far too much time moth trapping and yeah, hopefully it doesn't come across too much. But uh, yeah, I'm the Northern Ireland Moth Recorder, um, Nature Reserves Manager at Ulster Wildlife. So if anybody doesn't know who Ulster Wildlife are, we're one of the wildlife trusts, which is one of 47 or 48 wildlife trusts across uh, Great Britain and Northern Ireland, um, all independent doesn't mean we all speak with the same voice, you know, which is maybe a bit of a disadvantage, but it can be an advantage as well. In Northern Ireland, we have 14,000 members. So, you know, we're, we're small, but we're one of the larger conservation charities in Northern Ireland. Uh, and yes, I'm, I'm a volunteer moth trapper at uh, Murloc, uh, which is in County Down near Newcastle. I've been moth trapping there for nearly 20 years. Uh, and yeah, I took a bit of a head stagger about 12 years ago or 10 years ago and decided I should try and trap it as often as I can, but I try and forget about these things. Uh, moss in Northern Ireland, um, 1,192 species, you know, it's not too bad. And uh, the all Ireland total, 1,600 species. So there's been quite a few moths added in the, the last uh, couple of decades, and I'll get on to that a little bit later. Uh, but, uh, you know, not substantial enough to keep people like me happy, I suppose, 1,192 species and 1,600 in Ireland, more than enough to keep anybody happy. Uh, so anyway, how do I tenuously tie this thing in? Well, I mean, one of the sites that uh, I work at is Sleeve Nacloy. Uh, it's in the Belfast Hills. It's a uh, species-rich grassland. Um, County Antrim, Belfast Hills, I say, 125 hectares. So, you know, quite, quite a large site, comparatively speaking, uh, for a nature reserve. And in pretty good neck, uh, you know, a, a good neck before I came and managed it. But, uh, you know, I like to think that I'm, I'm doing my job and that, you know, it's continuing that way. Why do I mention Steve McCloy? Well, um, it's actually the Irish red list moth species. I suppose I'm doing this talk as a hybrid, as a here's some nature reserves, but they illustrate the state of play to an extent in Northern Ireland and uh, to a lesser extent in Ireland. So, you know, the hook here is Irish red, Irish red list moth species. So there's 71 Irish red list moth species as part of what Brian had mentioned earlier, the, the compilation of the list. So basically 10% of them were found at Slave McCloy, which is, you know, when you put it in those terms, I mean, that should relate some of the caliber of this particular grassland. Um, and it's particularly good for orchids as well. I mean, there's nine species of orchids. So in a Northern Ireland context, you know, it's, it's, it's one of the heavy hitters, I would say in terms of, you know, really, really good species rich grasslands. Um, and one of the species that you find there is a red carpet moth. So again, an Irish red list moth species. Uh, we're funded uh, through, part funded by NIA or DARA, um, basically to carry out a range of surveys, habitat management at Sleeve and Cloy, and happily for me, uh, that includes uh, surveying for Irish red list moths, so Northern Ireland priority species moths. Uh, so yeah, it's a nice distraction that, you know, as part of my job, I actually have to go out and actively look for moths. I think it's, I, just, I, wake, I do wake up, up well, it's, it's not the best job in the world because plenty of headaches like any job, but it's great when you can get up in the morning and realise, oh, brilliant, sun's shining, I'm going out to look for moths. So, yeah, I shouldn't advertise that fact because you'd all want my job or something. Anyway, if you look at red carpet in terms of an Irish red list species, I mean, there is the decline, you know, pre-2000, it's quite a rare beastie in Ireland, probably because of the moorland habitats and upland areas that it's found in. So it's probably not encountered quite as often, but I mean, even those maps illustrate the decline in that species, you know, quite a marked decline. Uh, I think it's listed as uh, endangered or vulnerable. I can't remember what category it was, but uh, certainly Sleeve Nacloy is one of the most regular sites. It feeds on ladies' mantle as the larval food plant. Um, but I mean, it's one of those things that, you know, if you really wanted to catch up with it now, if you really wanted to go and have a stab at trying to find, you probably need to go to Sleeve Nacloy if you want. You know, it's probably one of your better bets. It's kind of a bit of an indictment, you know, but 
you know, it's habitat loss perhaps and climate change, which are driving the changes in red carpet populations. But, uh, you know, not necessarily a good news story, apart from the fact that this year I recorded more red carpet at Slave McCloy than I ever have. Uh, and from across the site, so something, you know, in that little population up and down at Slave McCloy, certainly 2021 was a good year. So, you know, it's not all doom and gloom, and it could well be that red carpet, you know, occurs much more widely. It's just we're not picking it up because people aren't going up into the uplands to get cold and wet and the heads blown off them. Um, but that leads me into the Irish Red List moths. So that was uh, published in 2016, and uh, Brian was heavily involved in that. Uh, so um, 71 species, um, as Brian said, out of around 700 species in Ireland, and about 50 of those have been proven to occur in Northern Ireland. The reason I have that in italics is, is that these things change and these things are set in stone. Even that red carpet map, those maps are up to 2012. The, the Moth Atlas was published uh, by Butterfly Conservation in 2016, even that in those five years, things will have changed. Uh, but you know, 50 species proven to occur in Northern Ireland, and even in an Irish context, uh, the, the RE species, regional extinct, uh, since that list was published, um, Mullen suspected triple spotted clay and, and a couple of others, perhaps, you know, things that we were considered at the time to have been regional extinct was in, as in they hadn't been, hadn't occurred in Ireland for uh, at least 50 years. Um, you know, it shows you, you know, it shows you the importance, I think, of things like the red list and priority species list is it gives clear conservation targets or gives a clear guide to those species that are in trouble and sort of stimulates action. If not from government, it certainly stimulates action amongst recorders and you know people will go out and you know target these things and try and look for them. So I think they're really important on a, on a whole series of levels. Uh, so... <clears throat> Leading on from that, then, um, was the Northern Ireland Priority Species List. I think the original Priority Species List had uh, been compiled in the early 2000s with a review sometime around 2004, I think, and another review. Well, we reviewed it again a couple of years ago. Um, and basically, the previous list was a bit of a red herring because uh, the 66 species that occurred on the Northern Ireland List, because of the dearth of data, um, just assumptions had to be made. So an awful lot of the UK BAP species, if it was a UK BAP species, it was translated over to the Northern Ireland Priority List. Nobody's fault, really. It is about data deficiency. So, you know, fast forward another 15, 20 years, there's more data available. So we were able to make, you know, better qualified judgments on what should or shouldn't be on the list. And actually, it was more or less born out of the red list process. So we followed similar guidelines. And so we sort of distilled down what we learned from the red list and applied it to Northern Ireland in terms of the macro moths. So weirdly enough, we ended up with the same, exactly the same amount of moths on the list as the original list. Not all the same, but you know, it was just one of those weird quirks. Um, and as you can see there, one of the uh, criteria was that if it was an Irish red list species, it got on, obviously it would get onto the Northern Ireland list. And then the latest thing that we're working on at the moment, not as Ulster Wildlife, but as the Northern Ireland Moth Records Committee, as we tried to apply something similar for the first time to the micro moth species in Northern Ireland. Um, so we actually ended up with about uh, 48 species. Um, I suppose there's 1192 species in Northern Ireland. So there's 700 of those are micro moths. So we took the 700 micro moths known to have occurred up to the year 2020. And to be honest, we ended up an awful lot of species, which we know, whilst we know that they probably are rare and probably, you know, in applying different criteria, they might get onto the list, but using the criteria that we'd set, you know, there's too many species that are data deficient, but then people weren't really looking at micro moths in the same detail as they are these days. So that's the sort of a background framework for what we, we work towards. You know, um, the, the priority species micro list isn't uh, published yet. It still has to go in front of government and be signed off. But, you know, these, they do, you know, as a, as a nature reserves manager, they do help and provide a framework that, you know, if you want to enact action, conservation action for moths, you know, you know this, these at least highlight the key conservation priorities. And I think they're really, really useful. Uh, then still Steve McCloy and actually getting two nocturnal pollinators for a change in the talk so far for the first time. And one of the things that the first time I had ever heard of moths as pollinators and always wondered, there's 160,000 species in the world. What did we all think they were doing? 
you know what I mean? There's both those pollinators. What, really? Um, so one of the landmark papers, I guess, was uh, by Roy Sexton on the moth pollinators of greater butterfly orchids. And he, it is a rerun of a work that was carried out in Scandinavia. But you can see the list there of the you know, top 10 or 12 uh, species. Uh, and just to echo uh, Richard's talk, I mean, the majority of them are noctuids. Um, but a gold spangle moth uh, came out um, on top, way, way, way out on top, beyond any of the other species. And I say, all of, uh, just as an aside, all of those species occur at Sleeve McCloy. Uh, and Sleeve McCloy is known for its orchids, the nine species of orchids that occur there. But actually, one of the most common orchids is the greater butterfly orchid. It occurs in, you know, it's carpets of uh, greater butterfly orchids in some years. A good year, it's quite a spectacle. So, you know, there's the gold spangle moth, quite a distinctive moth. Um, but it did get me thinking, um, butterfly orchids, you know, gold spangle and these things, where, where, did, where did they occur? And, uh, th well, there before, there's a, a, apologies to Roy Saxton, but this is the idea is that these moths, they visit the greater butterfly orchid and the pollinia get stuck to their heads. So that's how these orchids are pollinated. Um, they, you could argue that they depend upon the moths, you know. So um, it's interesting when you look that, you know, here we have these moths that are heavily attracted to these orchids. They are, obviously there's a great association. And when you look at the maps from Moths Ireland, albeit these maps are up until 2015, I think, um, you can see the maps there, the gold spang, they took the top three and I just thought, I wonder what the maps look like. Uh, and there's gold spangle, of course, it has the, the greatest association with um, greater butterfly orchid. The large yellow wonder is a generalist, you know, it probably visits many different species of flowers. It's, it's a generalist in terms of, you know, it's polyphagus as well. Uh, beautiful golden wire in the middle, a similar sort of pattern. I stuck that in because you know, arguably you could look at the gold spangle map and say, well, that distribution might be related to a uh, recorder effort or it might be related to, you know, you're just, you know, well, the beautiful golden Y map actually, you know, argues against that. That's the beautiful golden Y is a, again a species that's attracted to light. You know, it's regularly recorded in moth traps. In fact, that's where most people will encounter it in moth traps. So, arguably, you could say that you know, the beautiful golden Y is a sort of validation of the 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 the, the distribution of the gold spangle in the sense that you know it's probably pretty accurate in terms of showing up. You know, where this gold spangle moth is. And then if you compare the BSBI map for a uh, greater butterfly orchid, it's quite interesting, the overlap. Now, I'm not a scientist at all. You know, I just, there's probably, I mean, there's obviously something in that. I mean, the orchid has a pretty restricted range and it overlaps pretty well with gold spangles. Quite interesting. Somebody can do something with that, but it's beyond my puny mind, you know. Uh, anyway, that's Sleeve de Cloy, you know, an example of, you know, species rich grass and sites, you know, um, one of the habitats most affected and one of you know, the greatest losses are species rich grass. And, and then this here site here is Glen Allen Bog. Um, again, another type of habitat that's been massively affected in Ireland. Um, that's a site that we actually bought. It's 45 hectares. Uh, we bought it last year through the NIA Challenge Fund. Um, we bought it actually because it's pretty wrecked. If it had been a pristine site, we probably wouldn't have bought it. The idea being is what intervention would, what's the most sensible intervention for us to wildlife to do? Do we use our money and resources and buy pristine sites that are already designated and protected? Or do we take a site that could be restored? You know, that's the argument. So this is where Glen Allen Bog falls in uh, and it's undesignated. So in one sense, that's an advantage because it means that in terms of bog restoration, we can apply, you know, maybe techniques that you know, we might have had to jump through legislative hoops for, you know, in terms of permissions on a designated site, particularly uh, an SAC, for example, where a habitat's regulation assessment might be required here. We can we can employ what we think are the best uh, bog restoration methods. And it, it, the site, uh, heavily modified surface, it was drained in preparation for forestry at one point, the historical peak cutting around the edges, like most bogs, lowland raised bog, uh, there's no lag fan. Uh, some people enjoyed on a you know, multi-annual basis burning the place. Um, but despite that, walking onto the site, there are, you know, well, I put in inverted commas rare moths, but uh, they probably are under-recorded because let's face it, who, who spends time going around walking across bogs? You know, it's, 
it's getting it's kind of a niche. You know, most people don't like getting their feet wet. But um, I mean, that Glyph Fitrix Hall with Anna picture, that's only the fifth record for Northern Ireland. Now, I just think these things are under-recorded. But it does make me think, and like Notcrass is another moth, a, a, a Noctuid moth, um, not that many records in Northern Ireland, all associated with lowland raised bog sites. So it, did make, it does make me think, I mean, this is a heavily impacted site, um, and, you know, or to use the technical term, trashed. And uh, there's still some interesting stuff there, you know. Um, it, it does make you think what might it have been like uh, before it had been impacted. But uh, you can see there's the picture of the area of the bog on the left. And then on the right is we uh, commissioned RPS to, uh, well, we commissioned LIDAR star event, which is basically flying a plane over it. Uh, and it's light detecting and ranging. It's a form of radar, uh, which gave us the bog profile in terms of the, the height of the bog, the slope in the bog, which in then in turn infers how much runoff there is. The greater the runoff and the greater the slope, the less chance of sphagnum formation. No sphagnum, no bog. Uh, well, certainly not an active growing bog. Um, so the yellow lines on that map on the right are all the drains. Um, the purple areas are the, the areas of least slope, so the areas of greatest uh, restoration potential. So that's basically what we're going to do to ban the home bog. Um, we're going to put in seven and a half kilometres of uh, bonding, uh, peat bonds, uh, around about 425 dams, uh, funded through the Dyer Project. And the reason I stuck that in is that, you know, there is an awful lot of habitat restoration work out there that is being carried out across Ireland, particularly in bogs and species-rich grasslands. You know, there's an awful lot of focus on uh, tree planting. Um, it's arguable whether all those trees are going into the right places, but that's a debate for another day. Um, but uh, you know, there are there is an awful lot of work going into restoration, and an awful lot of that restoration will benefit moths. Um, one of the other projects that we have in our own organisation is the CAN project, which is Interreg funded. So that's collaborative action across the Natura network. Of course, I've spelled it wrong. Um, and then another thing that uh, is happening at the moment in terms of habitat restoration, looking at it in the long term and looking at habitat restoration potential is the approach of nature recovery networks, which will benefit you know, wildlife as a whole. So that's an approach in Northern Ireland where the Woodland Trust, National Trust and RSPB and Ulster Wildlife, we've got together, we have an officer in place, uh, Nina Schoenberg, and we're looking a bit at basically how we can restore Northern Ireland on a landscape scale. Uh, part of the Wildlife Trust's approach is uh, achieving 30 by 30, which is 30% of the land and sea uh, restored for wildlife by uh, 2030, or at least you know, protected. A uh, bit deflating that Boris Johnson came along a couple of weeks later and announced something similar, and you kind of thought that takes the shine off that. But I better move on because I've got political. Um, Umbra, I'll stick in Umbra because, I mean, to me, Umbra is synonymous with moths. I mean, I love Murlock Nature Reserve and Umbra to me is just, a, it's like a, a mini sort of distilled down, extremely rich, species-rich dune grassland. It's a wonderful site um, on the north coast in County Derry, uh, 45 hectare coastal sand dune. It's part of McGilligan SS, uh, SAC, it's an SSI, uh, one of the new, apart from being a coastal grassland, uh, it has, it's notable for its humid dune slacks, which essentially where the water table uh, sits at the, the level of uh, the dunes, you know, so in wintertime, parts of the dunes are flooded, uh, which brings with it its own characteristic uh, uh, flora and fauna. And again, Umbra is one of those sites, 330 species of moths, so, you know, basically, what's that, uh, you know, uh, nearly a, over a quarter of the Northern Irish fauna, uh, about a fifth of the Irish fauna, and includes several uh, red list species. Um, a stick, uh, well, there's a map of where it is, um, it, you know, it's, why did I stick that in? I don't know. It's not really good. Um, but it shows you the, 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 the extent of McGilligan SAC. It is one of the most important sand dune systems in uh, the UK and Ireland. Um, the red line in, within, inset within that is the Umbra Nature Reserve. Um, and uh, the, basically the reason the Umbra Nature Reserve exists was because the Riley family uh, saw, you can see on that map, that little that white rectangle to the left of the red line boundary. It's a caravan park. So like an awful lot of these habitats, <clears throat> um, they were either going to be turned in, if it's a sand dune, coastal sand dune habitat, one of three things was going to happen. It turned into a caravan park, um, planted out with trees, or turned into a golf course, such as the fate of most sand dunes. Uh, thankfully, the foresight of the Riley family, you know, uh, it's been a, you know, we've had it on lease from them since 1978. 
why did I mention the Umbra? Well, it's about research and the research that's going on in Northern Ireland. So um, there's not much at the moment, but one potential thing, and here's I'm just flagging this up in case anybody would be interested. Uh, and if you are interested, contact Rose Kremen, uh, the Senior Conservation Officer at Book Ride Conservation. There's a little moth at Umbra. It's a redless species. Um, it's uh, scarce crimson and gold, um, Pyrostra sanguinalis. It feeds on wild thyme. Uh, it likes a mosaic of wild thyme and bare sand areas. That's about as much as we know. Essentially, that is it. All the rest is supposition. And uh, nobody really knows about the ecology of these, this species. So if somebody is interested in moths, and, and this does tie into pollination because, you know, whilst it's primarily a day flying moth, um, it can be trapped at light as well. So, I mean, these things, a day flying moth is not always a day flying moth. Many, you know, many of them can't be found in light traps. Um, so there is a potential uh, with Queen's University, um, there's potential for an MSc dissertation project, or, you know, there could be something more if, you know, so it's, it's if somebody's interested, it is, uh, it is worth contacting Rose about that. Um, as a site manager, you know, I, I am lucky in the sense that, you know, the practical conservation at Umbra does specifically involve moths because it involves the scarce crimson and gold, uh, the red list species, um, and it also involves a, a moth called small agar, which is um, a part of the Lassie Campidae family, I think. Uh, and essentially, small agar feeds on blackthorn. It likes scrub, blackthorn and hawthorn. It makes the larval webs pretty conspicuous, as you can see in the picture there. Makes it quite easy for um, uh, surveying them. Whereas, so that, that, that's one feature of the Umbra site. Uh, so I have to balance that and the requirements of small agar and its, its need for blackthorn scrub against the open uh, short turf and sand time dominated habitat of the Pyrostra sanguinalis. So, you know, there's, you know, there are within one site are two conflicting habitat requirements for two moth species, but I quite enjoy that, you know, because it means I have to actively think about moths for my work and I can get away with it. Um, but definitely there is a project there if anybody would be interested. So I've covered coastal grassland, I've covered bog, I've covered species-rich grassland, and the last thing I suppose I'm going to cover is um, oak woodlands. And uh, we, lucky enough, in Ulster Wildlife, as part of Glenarm Estate, there's the Glenarm Oakwoods SSI. Um, it has been described as one of the best parklands in Western Europe by a guy called Keith Alexander, who did a scoping study in uh, uh, woodlands and wood pasture, um, which is quite an accolade. Um, and it's fine, you can go around and say this all you want. Oh, yes, this is one of the most important wood pastures and you know, blah, blah, blah in Western Europe. But we did a bio blitz in uh, 2014 as part of the All-Ireland Bio Blitz. And within 24 hours, 1,100 species of all taxa um, were recorded at Glenarm. You know, I think that's a quite a... You know, and it was a rubbish day in May, quite cold overnight. We did have something like 34 moth traps out, I think. So we might have been at a bit of an advantage to... The, the competitors, I don't think that, you know, they thought we're, well, we're that mad, but yeah, why not? You got to go for these things. Um, but I, I think that is reflective of how important uh, these ancient oak woodlands are. Uh, and, you know, places like Glen Arm, uh, if 1,100 species can be recorded uh, within that parkland within in 24 hours in May, what might occur within a year? Um, with the active work that we're doing there is a, a task called Oak Halloween. So basically over decades, um, the oak woodland, the wood pasture, uh, these large open grown oak trees with species rich grass underneath them, uh, grazing had ceased. So therefore that meant that uh, they'd heavily scrubbed up and uh, tree species such as ash, alder, uh, hazel had actually punched up through the canopy of the oak trees and were negatively impacting on them. So what we do is we do a phased removal and in concert with advice from uh, NIA, um, basically what we're doing is we're trying to prolong the life of the oak trees. And, you know, at the top there, oh, I should have mentioned at the top of the bio blitz, what they discover, well, amongst other things, a new species of moth in Ireland, uh, Pamine splendidulana. And then last, uh, 2020, actually, um, I did, uh, I always like to do moth night, uh, you know, the National Moth Night. I always like to do it at Glenarm, primarily because the dates are usually chosen in England and they never seem to tally with a date that's suitable in Ireland because they always forget that it rains most of the time here. So picking, picking a date like September doesn't really fit for a good night's moth trapping unless you're undercover. So Glenarm provides that. So, you know, worst case scenario, you know, do moth night at Glenarm, and it paid off. I got a new species to Northern Ireland, which was the second Irish species. Um, and it's a species that's a colonist. Um, it's quite interesting, Devon Carpet. I mean, the name 
in itself should you know infer heavily of you know where this moth formerly was found. It was just in southern England and South Wales. It has taken off now. Um, the reason I mentioned that is because a new species to Northern Ireland. And actually, it was a bit cheeky because uh, being a nature reserves manager and asked what what events do I want to do. Well, when it came to uh, an event for Ultra Wildlife members this year, I picked exactly the same date as I'd recorded uh, Devon Carpet last year. And happily enough, I found it at the same place. So that confirms, you know, that there's a population there and that, you know, it, it's, it probably is becoming well established. So new species to Northern Ireland then, you know, just to put that in context, to look at the last couple of years, you know, there's quite a few species being found on an annual basis. Um, 13 in 2018, 2019 bumper year, you know, 18 species and then, Something, I don't know what happened in the year 2020. Something something of pretty profound consequences must have happened that, I don't know, maybe people couldn't weren't allowed out of their houses or something like that. But certainly, uh, let, obviously, COVID obviously had an impact. And this year as well, um, just, I don't want to talk about that. But anyway, there's different, you can't look at these things just as new species. Things uh, like the Devon carpet, I mean, that, that's gone through an almost exponential rise. It's now found in Cumbria. It's no surprise that it's colonised Ireland. It feeds on things like marsh bed straw. The dusky thorn is a different thing. I actually had that in my garden, second Irish species, uh, first for Northern Ireland. Uh, don't think that's going to do too well because it feeds on uh, feeds on ash, unfortunately, as a caterpillar. So, uh, uh, And the fact that it's not, certainly not going to occur in that garden again because it's uh, since been bulldozed and flats are built on it. Um, and then you have another category. And so you have these species that are colonizing of their own volition, of their own accord, whether it be, you know, because they've got wings or because of climate change. But then you've got other species that are inventive. So the mint moth was found in a garden center. In fact, it was found in a garden center during lockdown. And the guy wouldn't give me the precise location for fear that people would twitch it. As in for fear that moth people would come in their droves to come and see this species on an imported mint plant. Um, anyway, the other one that um, uh, seems to have been overlooked and would probably account for the larger numbers in 2018 and 2019 is the increase in leaf miners, probably a, you know, a, a, an arena of uh, moth recording that's you know, been largely overlooked, um, which is essentially those species of moths that feed in between you know, the upper and lower epidermis of a leaf and, and all their tactics. But, uh, you know, most people wouldn't even know they exist. So uh, it's a sort of a, a new burgeoning field. If you want to add something new to Ireland, start looking at leaves. Uh, and actually on the topic of new species to Ireland, I'm not going to steal any thunder. There's a, the Moths Ireland and the Northern Ireland Moth uh, Records Committee, or there's an upcoming, upcoming article in the Tropus magazine, uh, which basically summarizes and will list um, the, basically over 150 new species of moths have been recorded in Ireland since 2001. So uh, it's, qu it's quite an achievement. Um, and if you want to read more about it, you're going to have to buy a tropus. Uh, what do I do apart from that? That's the day job. Unfortunately, when I go home, uh, I can't seem to give up. Um, Andy, uh, what, are you, are you nearly finished? Or? Yep, nearly finished. All I'm going to say is the Moth Records Committee takes up the rest of the time. There's nearly over half a million moth records in Northern Ireland. All of that data has to be cleaned and it comes in in various forms. It's sent to, when it's all done, it's all sent to CEDAR. It's disseminated to the right people. It's sent to Moths Ireland. The moth produces the Moths Ireland map. It's sent to Butterfly Conservation. That's the macro moths. And then there's Murloc. And I'm glad I left this to the end. And I knew I wouldn't have time because then it don't seem quite so insane because I've only got a limited amount of time to talk about it. It's a June Heathland owned by the National Trust. First nature reserve in Ireland, potentially, uh, since 1967. I went a bit crazy and I decided that I should try and moth trap as much as I can, could. And yeah, I probably have visited over 3,000 times in the last 10 years, never mind the last 20. And I did get to the point that I would go to the moth trap go back home, have a cup of tea, something to eat, and think, do you know what? I need to go back to Merlock and see if I can find some more moths. And then I'd go, this is crazy. It's too hot out here. But then I would wait until the sun went down, and then it would go out again. Awful. I would go there in the middle of winter and stand on the avenue with headlights and a, moth and a butterfly net, hoping to catch moths. Uh, and why did I do it? Well, 10% of all the moth records in Northern Ireland are from Merlock. I don't know whether that's a good thing, but I, I got the moth list up to 798 species which is driving me absolutely insane because I would much rather it be 800 species. Why? I don't know, because Murloc is actually Murloc Lower Townland. I lived in Murloc Upper Townland. So if you combine the two, there's 818 species. But I did get six new species to Ireland and added 30 new species to the Northern Ireland list. And all I can say is moths are becoming popular. There's more moth trappers. Send in your records. Just give in to your obsessions. And uh, that map there, 
which shows you the Ireland's macro moths recorded by species density. I think we should all work to try and turn as much of that map red as possible. So there you go. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andy. I knew it would be a good talk, and I was reluctant to, to stop you, but you got on to Merlock at the end. Which ah, well, yeah, you see, I, I did purposely keep it to the end two sides because I thought if I'm actually honest about this and let people know how, um, you see, my wife's probably in the next room wanting to come in and say, he's completely <laughs> insane, he's insane. The thing is, it is good, though, moths are such, as Richard pointed out earlier, moths are such a diverse group that, you know, that you can have lots and lots of fun, interest, learning, whatever you want. It's it's an almost limitless topic, you know, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, and, and without without the dedication of people like Andy, um, who does the verification as well, we wouldn't have the data set that Callum and people like that can use or, or other people can use in the analysis. Uh, so there's an awful lot of work uh, going on to, and a lot of people have turned the moths in lockdown. Lockdown has had that positive impact. Mm. Um, so um, I think we're now going to go to question and answers, and I'm just going to start looking through the. Uh, see if I can catch up. So Molly Crilly had a question, which I think you answered, Andy, in your talk, saying, uh, "Have you a plan in place for Glen Allen Bog?" You showed a slide. Um, mm. about rewetting it. I don't know. If you want to give any more details on that or? But that was covered enough in the talk, I think, for Molly. You were yeah. talking about the funds and things like that. Yeah, but well, so all we could say, I could say is, you know, it's, it's mostly funded by um, NIA, there through the Challenge Fund. And there were various scenarios. That, so basically there was, I think, four scenarios, uh, A through to D. Uh, scenario D was the all singing, all dancing. Well, we've got, we've managed to get enough money to do scenario C. So essentially all of the high bog, Will be restored and it still leaves us scope to carry out future restoration work so um yeah i mean it's something that should be you know it's happening across ireland you know there's an awful lot of yeah there's there's, there's a lot of restoration and, and and these new techniques that people are are, are learning and discovering these these bundings mm. uh, so uh we're going to go to callum there's a question here with callum from donica um and maybe richard as well but certainly callum um you see that callum in the q a Asking about uh, the possible conflicts between advice for bat, uh, for bat conservation in Ireland, about using LEDs on the on the light levels. I'm not sure what the f well, that's a, that's a wavelength. I I, I I was never very good at physics, um, and Kelvin and wavelengths always befuddle me. But uh, I think I do understand the principle. But do you, do you want to comment on that, Calm? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah. It, it, it's an interesting question because because you're quite right, um, Donica, that that it's going to be tricky to to do something that that works for for every taxon if we get into trying to address this problem by using color temperatures and wavelengths and such like. I, I will say that I think that the solutions that involve turning lights off, part night lighting and such like, pretty much should work for everything. Um, the the recommendations that that you put in the in the in the queue and that a there for for bats i would say on the whole are going to work pretty well for moths um avoiding white and blue wavelengths avoiding ultraviolet wavelengths using uh higher um higher nanometer uh peaks so that's more towards the sort of yellow red end of the spectrum um these are all things that should work for moths i i, I would I raise an eyebrow slightly at the comment that LEDs will be used as these emit minimal ultraviolet light. I think that depends on the LED, and I think a lot of ultra, uh, a lot of off-the-shelf, commercially available LEDs, um, that might not be true for. Um, and certainly, the, 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 a lot of the white LEDs in, in inverted commas are, are pretty much emitting blue light. Um, but it is quite possible to 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 buy if you go looking for them LEDs that that. Uh, emit um, much more yellow red um, spectral um, uh, uh, wavelengths um, they just don't tend to be the, the bog standard ones um, there is then you know in my wearing my new hat as, a, as an ornithologist there is the problem that that all of these things that are going to work for moths and bats are probably going to do the worst thing possible for, for birds because birds seem to respond to very different um, spectra and we know that migratory birds seem to respond quite um, 
uh, to have quite uh, damaging responses to, to colors like green light and things like that. Um, so, so that's why I say if you start getting into trying to solve the problem by using different wavelengths, you, you're potentially getting into dangerous ground and it's better to look for solutions that involve turning the lights off if possible. And, and I accept that it's not always possible. Okay, thanks. Um, and here's from Susie. Is there a list of the best plants for nocturnal pollinators as there is for daytime pollinators? Um, that could be used in mitigation for habitat loss. Anybody want to field that question? I mean, Richard Richard gave, gave mentioned some some plants, so uh, Nicotiana and stuff like that. Those tend to be garden plants. Um, I mean, honey, honeysuckle is one of very obvious nocturnal um, flowering plant that certainly hawk moths feed on, uh, uh, and, and quite a few moths feed on as as, as the larvae. Um, I'm not quite sure whether there's a a, a, a list um, that could be provided in that in that way. And yeah, probably just. Brian? Sorry, yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's, uh, there's not a, a very specific list that I'm aware of. There might be something with the butterfly conservation. They might have something there. Um, of course, there's a list of plants uh, associated with the paper that I published, but those are a lot of those are kind of arable weeds. If you, um, uh, if you're if you're it depends on the landscape you're talking about so if um if you're talking about garden there's lots of garden plants that you can that you can plant that help moss but if you're talking about the more natural landscape it's it's you you can plant you can plant a lots of different type of plants that would normally be found in that area but it's also would the plants do well on their own there so if they don't if if conditions have made it so that the plants aren't going to do well, then that's not going to really help. And so so it, it depends on the landscape, I would say. Yeah. So as as Richard um, suggested, butterfly conservation do indeed have um, some really good information about sorts of garden plants that can be really helpful. Um, they break it down by by caterpillar food plants and by nectar plants. And of course, it's important to, to try and remember to have uh, provide some of both because uh, each one is useless in the absence of the other. That's my view anyway. Um, so uh, I've put a link in the chat to, to where some of that information is held. But, but just looking through, there's there's a whole load of suggestions for, for different caterpillar food plants. And then uh, under the next plants, they suggest things like honeysuckle, jasmine, evening primrose, night scented stock. Uh, Nicotiana that, that Richard mentioned earlier, these sorts of things, which are all um, really good as, as nighttime next sources. And, and a lot of which would be good as... I, I, would, I would say for guards, um, I mean, a, lot, a lot of those are non-native plants. And I know, I know evening, evening primrose is spreading uh, madly on sand dunes. I don't know whether Andy has to deal with that. but uh, yes. Thankfully not. But uh, it's a problem at Merlock. I suppose I should just mention, uh, in case I, uh, I get my, in case I get sacked, is that Ulster Wildlife does have currently its campaign "Let Nature In," which is to encourage people, including you know, for pollen. Actually, to be honest, it's primarily for pollinators. To be honest, it's about encouraging people to do something in the garden. Uh, now, it's for hedgehogs and things like that as well. And, you know, but obviously, it's it, an, an awful lot of it focuses on the types of flowers that you can plant but you know that's for daytime and nighttime so yeah that saved me from getting a p45 okay thanks andy um the, there was a, a question also and uh what would be the advice to someone who wanted to get out and start moth trapping recording anybody want to take that on use led lights that's great controversy in the moth world, isn't it? LED lights or the old mercury vapor lamps. Um, it just depends what you want to do, I suppose. I mean, my advice, uh, if you have a garden, uh, get a moth trap. But again, butterfly conservation is one of the best uh, starting points on this. I mean, they will have advice, uh, and sometimes on the local uh, branch groups as well, uh, on how to make homemade moth traps, things like that. So it needn't be you know, an exclusive thing, you know, because moth traps are expensive. I mean, your standard um, actinic light moth trap, you know, you're talking about uh, around about 100, 120 pound plus a 30 pound battery if you want it, something that's portable. 
uh, a mercury vapor trap, uh, the Robinson trap, um, you're talking around three hundred pound um, for one of the better ones. You can't get cheaper ones, but you can get what you pay for. But there are ways that you can make your own. Uh, I'm putting in a disclaimer there. I don't advise you to make your own. Go to Butterfly Conservation. That's a disclaimer in case you electrocute yourself or burn your house down. But uh, other than that, it's a, it does depend upon what you want to do. I find moth trapping is one of those. It's just a very nice passive activity, not necessarily passive for the moth, but for the observer, it's a good way of finding out. You, you an average garden in a in a sort of a, a decently vegetated urban area, and in Northern Ireland, you can get in excess of two hundred species. A year in your garden, perhaps more. Um, but other than that, it's uh, you know uh, a butterfly net. Go, I mean, it shouldn't be called a butterfly net. So I said, let my butterfly bias get in there again. But yeah, go out with a net and start sweeping and see what you can find. And um, the books are there. And the, and the other thing is the Facebook groups. I mean, the, the classic books, the book, the Micro Moths Guide to the British Isles, Macro Moths Guide to the British Isles, and um, the recent one on caterpillars. Uh, brilliant guides and uh, the local groups in an Irish context. You can't beat going on to the Butterfly Conservation Northern Ireland Facebook page and the Moths Ireland page. There, I would say, you know, if you've, and if you have questions, they're the places to go in an Irish context. Yeah, well, one of the one of the downsides of very different downsides of COVID is that moth trapping used to be an event that was run by organisations, and that was that was really the best place to go and. Mm. Ask these questions, see see what type of traps they were yeah. running. Unfortunately, those, those events don't happen. And it's like anything else. The the advice is is often personal. People find their system is best, or or they can make their own system. Or, or as Andy says, um, you know, you got you got to be, know what you're doing um, because you're dealing with electricity and and outside the nighttime and things in the in the wet and things. But it, it 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 is yeah it is an activity that is very accessible and some some people can just start by searching their house walls you know if you like, you like the wall of a house and uh, that can attract moths um, on the continent it's it's very common just to have a white sheet and a very bright light but you do have to stay around your moth trap then if you want to see see them whereas uh, it's less common less common on the continent to have the closed moth traps that we have in in Britain and Ireland. Mm -hmm. uh, but that, that that's a question actually I wanted to ask Callum and apologies Callum if I if I missed that in your talk but I mean your your your, th your thesis partly at the beginning was that the moth decline is not necessarily a decline related to habitat but more related simply to, to light pollution but light, light pollution only comes along whenever land gets developed and so how how much of the how much of the decline in moths is actually not caused by the light pollution directly, but by the fact that you've mm. now got housing, you've now got roads, therefore the habitat that the moths need. There's no plants. You know, is is that factored into into? Can you can you comment on that, or am I just barking up the wrong tree? No, you're absolutely not barking up the wrong tree. I think that's um, a big part of the reason why why you know in time of 2013 when the state of state of larger moths report was written we, we didn't really feel like we knew whether light pollution was important because all of the all of the spatial analyses that tried to get at this hit hit, hit exactly this problem that that light light pollution is is very tightly tied into to urbanization which has all of its own effects um i i, I think the two studies that 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 i that i showed in my talk um, I felt that those two were, were the most persuasive in terms of there being an actual effect of light pollution above and beyond urbanisation, because they kind of, they kind of found ways to to unpick the two um, from each other. So uh, in the case of of the, the the Dutch study, they included variables that related to urbanisation, and they included variables that related to light pollution. And it was, it was the light pollution ones that that really strongly predicted declines right. or otherwise. Um, in the case of Doug Boys' study, um, uh, essentially he used he used rural um, rural streetlights, which are quite hard to find, um, <laughs> as it turns out. Um, they tend to be associated with road junctions and roundabouts and things like that. But you're taking, you know, you're you're working in in an agricultural landscape um, where where the, those urbanisation effects they're still there because you still have roads, you still have traffic, you still have noise pollution and you know, air pollution, things like that, but they're much less than they would be in, in a city or, or, or something like that. Um, 
so no, you're not barking up the wrong tree at all. Uh, um, urbanisation is 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 certainly also a factor that impacts moths, but I think that that the light pollution effect um, above and beyond that, we can be pretty confident is real. Um, I would say that I, you know I, I think light pollution is is important, and certainly the Dutch study suggested it might be the most important thing. I don't know if I I would feel confident to say that yet. Climate change, habitat loss, all of these other things are also important as well. Um, and and part of the problem is that moths are being exposed to the whole lot of them yeah. all at the same time. And, and, you know, maybe they could deal with one at a time and evolve to deal with one at a time. But 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 when they're faced with six, seven, eight drivers of change all impacting them at the same time, it becomes a much more difficult prospect. Well, th th thanks very much for clarifying. I must, I must look out that paper and, uh, um, yeah, it, 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 it these ones, these ones, you know, what, what is a correlation is, is that the cause and effect thing as well? You know, it is, it is very difficult to tease out, especially when you're dealing with uh, with a situation where everything is lit. And how do you find, how do you find the site that, yeah, that, that allows you to study it where, where there's no lighting and things? There are, there are, there are these little funny places in Northern Ireland where, where you have these little, little settlements, so a row of two, four, three or four houses, and they all have street lights around them. But mm -hmm. The habitats around them are buggered anyway, so uh, they're all they're all agricult intensive agricultural land. But I find people are addicted to keeping lights on. I, I, may not, I don't know what it's like in the rest of the the in GB, but I mean, uh, you know, I I used to drive my wife mad on drives from Newcastle to Belfast at night or back from Belfast, where I would play the unnecessary light game, which just <laughs> consisted of me going one to, you know, then it would go to 129, 130, 136. Look at that person, they've got six lights out there. And, but actually the point was, all these lights were totally unnecessary. Absolutely. You just think, do you know how much money you're spending? You know, and actually that's not a good argument for not a lot of people. If you told them that they spent £25 a year on that one outside security light, they go, so what? You know, but it's totally unnecessary. You know, it's, it's a madness, a madness. But yeah, if you ever board play the unnecessary light game, it's riveting. Yeah, I, 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 I'm playing county oak, oak trees on uh, on my walks now, and uh, that, that's actually a very interesting issue for for grassland management. O oak trees and jays. Uh, mm. I mean, that, that's that's going totally off off the radar. But anyway, um, I don't see any more questions. There's someone there asked about hiring out moth traps, but I think mm. that would be a that would be unlikely. I don't think there's anywhere that um, hires them out in that sense because, you know, hiring our electrical equipment is just, you know, for insurance purposes and things like that. Um, again, that, that, that really, it, it's whenever, whenever we get back to normal, if we ever get back to a normal and events start up again, that really is the, is the thing to go to. And I'm sure people like Andy and also Wildlife Trust and other organisations will, will start those events again. And they really give you that opportunity to see moth traps in in operation. Um, Liz, do you see any more questions there? I don't see any. No, I don't think. Just to say for you there, put in a link to to Moth Ireland. So just to have yeah. an organisation yeah. there as well. But um, no, I think. Yeah, I mean, Google is is a great friend in, in that regard. There, there are lots. Of, I'm not going to give the names of separate organisations that sell moth traps, but there are there are um, moth traps uh, or companies that sell sell moth traps. Uh, mostly for unfortunately for Irish people now, based, they are based in the UK. And you have this problem, but the the delights of Brexit and benefits of Brexit and getting them posted across, uh, and then back, batteries are also a problem as well. Sorry. Sorry, Brian. Sorry, and uh, kind of a bit un uh, not related to that, but um, just am I right in thinking that you need a license to trap moths in Ireland? You yes, uh, there is a quirk. There is a quirk in the legislation in in the Republic. Uh, you do you need a license to operate a light trap to trap animals, and as we know, moths are animals. Um, the intention, however, had not been for that. Um, but it is, it is it's a it's a relatively simple process, and yes, it's a very good point I've made um, legally. And well, it, it's a light trap for for any animal. So you know, if if you're using a light a moth trap to catch caddis flies, you need a license. If you're using a light trap light to catch fairies, 
you need you need you need you need that if you, if if you if you can find any fairies to, to catch, of course. I, I don't I have never heard any reports of that. But uh, and and you know, if you're using them for any any animals, yes, you have to use it. You have to have a license. But it was intention was was for hunting mammals, unfortunately. Okay. They missed missed uh, a, a legislation that was badly drafted in that sense. And uh, just to say thanks to to everybody from from myself, and I, I think I put that message in there about um, where would you start or any advice? Because uh, I'm definitely you now inspired to go out and, and see what I can can figure out. So thank you for me. Yeah, and thank thanks very much for the, all the three speakers, uh, Richard, Callum, and Andy. This has been a, a really interesting uh, topic. Uh, and you know, as, as Callum and Richard particularly have, have have shown as their research, you know, it's something that's yeah been under the radar. It's it is an issue that's extremely important. I'm not sure how you mitigate against it. It's 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 obviously something positive. And yeah, with this new LED light replacement that's going on, uh, and I suspect as as Callum said that that was mostly to I suspect to counteract the the light bouncing upwards. Um, you know, creating the dark skies in that sense, but then that perhaps intensifies the light that actually hits the ground, which is what will affect the moths. Um, but yeah, it's an issue. I'm not sure it's at all easy to uh, to solve. Uh, so um, yeah, there's a few positive comments, a lot of positive comments here from people. So thank you all again, three speakers for for talking and and for Liz for organising the event. And thank and, you, Brian, uh, for your chairing duties. Okay, and, and we we're actually we we're actually on time. Uh, so <laughs> uh, thanks, thanks very much. So we'll let we'll end it there and, and everybody have a have a good day. Perfect. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Bye.